Some experts argue that in some cases, processed foods are even more addictive than drugs, alcohol, or cigarettes. Well, it's not exactly a coincidence. Packaged snacks have always been hard to put down. Oreos were invented as far back as 1912, and snacks like Snickers and Fritos date back to the 1930s. But obesity in the US didn't start causing alarm until the late 70s, and rates really started to spike between 1980 and 2008. So what happened here? Big tobacco had something to do with it. It all started around 1953, when more and more studies came out pointing to the negative health effects of smoking. Big tobacco was, for obvious reasons, stressed about how this could impact their business. So they started looking to diversify their portfolios. And in 1963, RJ Reynolds, the makers of Camel, Newport, and Pall Mall cigarettes, purchased Hawaiian Punch. It just so happens that it purchased the fruit juice right before the first Surgeon General's report came out in 1964. And this was the report that marked one of the first major shifts in Americans' public opinion of smoking. Previously, Hawaiian Punch had been marketed as a cocktail mixer for adults, but RJ Reynolds pivoted to market the sugary beverage to kids. They utilized the drink's colorful mascot, Punchy, to appeal to young children, a strategy they would later use with Joe the Camel to sell cigarettes before being banned from doing so. And tobacco executives were well aware of the importance of building brand loyalty at an early age. When they did this by marketing flavored cigarettes to minors, it was a way of constantly generating new replacements smokers or customers. But perhaps even more disturbing was the way RJ Reynolds tampered with Hawaiian Punch's formula. See, the company had decades of experience of creating flavoring additives for cigarettes and chewing tobacco. So it applied these lessons to make Hawaiian Punch's flavors extra enticing. In fact, under RJ Reynolds' leadership, Hawaiian Punch went from offering a mere two flavors to a whopping 16. The company's manager of biochemical research at the time wrote an internal memo stating that RJ Reynolds was in the flavor business and that the flavors they developed for cigarettes would be useful in food, beverage, and other products, leading to large financial returns. A 1985 company report wrote that the goal in the development of these products was to, quote, leave people wanting more. And this was just the beginning. RJ Reynolds began growing its food and drink portfolio with the purchase of Del Monte in 1979 and the purchase of Hugline, a liquor company, in 1983. By the mid-80s, it was clear that the anti-smoking campaigns were working. The number of regular smokers in the U.S. fell from 42.4% in 1965 to a little over 30% by 1985. So in 1985, RJ Reynolds buys Nabisco brands for $4.9 billion. Then, in 1988, Philip Morris, the maker of Marlboro and Parliament cigarettes, buys Kraft for $13.1 billion. And this is where packaged food really seems to go off the rails. A recent study by the University of Kansas compared the foods produced by Big Tobacco to those that were not between 1988 and 2001, a period of time where Big Tobacco essentially led the food industry. More specifically, they looked at the nutritional makeup of the 105 best-selling food products owned by Big Tobacco and compared them with 587 other food products sold at the same time. The analysis revealed that tobacco company foods were 29% more likely to be fat and sodium hyperpalatable and 80% more likely to be carbohydrate and sodium hyperpalatable. The researchers say that these findings suggest that Big Tobacco chemically engineered these foods to elicit cravings and light up the reward centers of our brains, which is something that happens when we consume other addictive substances like recreational drugs. And what does hyperpalatable mean, you ask? The University of Kansas researchers define a hyperpalatable food as one that contains a specific mix of ingredients to enhance its palatability beyond what any one key ingredient could do naturally. Often these hyperpalatable foods contain an enticing mixture of fat, sugar, carbohydrates, and sodium. A great example of one of these hyperpalatable foods is this product. Lunchables came out in 1988 after Philip Morris acquired Kraft. And if you've ever had one of these, you can attest it's quite a potent combination of salt and fat. I personally was pretty addicted to these when I was little. Yeah, tastes pretty much the same. 
As if chemically tweaking our food wasn't enough, in 2015, the Center for Public Integrity found that several of the major food companies owned by Big Tobacco had ties with food scientists that helped them bypass certain safety testing standards. And they did this by having these food scientists deem some of the ingredients as generally recognized as safe. And many of these same food scientists had done similar work for Big Tobacco. So it would appear that the companies that for years marketed and sold one of the most addictive products that we know today, went ahead and bought companies that make food, something we have to consume to survive, and found a way to make it habit forming. To be clear, this wasn't all big tobacco. Other food companies were clearly developing hyperpalatable foods as well. But the research implies that big tobacco was certainly one of the biggest players during this period. In 1999, R.J. Reynolds officially split its tobacco and food businesses. Chairman and chief executive at the time, Stephen F. Goldstone, said that this was to allow investors to invest in either a tobacco company or a food company. But according to the New York Times, he also acknowledged the tobacco taint that had hurt the stock performances of the company. In 2001, Philip Morris officially announced it was changing its name to the Altria Group in an effort to get away from the bad reputation that being the world's most famous cigarette maker had caused. And in 2007, Kraft split from Altria Group altogether. But the impact they had on American food lives on. Today, the chemically addictive, salty, fatty, and sweet foods that Big Tobacco helped to create make up 68% of the American food supply. While only 15% of Americans between ages 24 and 70 were considered obese in 1980, by 2000, that number was 30%. And by 2020, that number had reached 40%. And despite the growing evidence that many of these ingredients that make food addictive have been banned in several countries, including China, India, and much of Europe, the US still allows for them to be used. So the next time you find yourself unable to stop from polishing off a whole bag of chips, or you see a toddler have a meltdown in a grocery store over cookies, stop and think to yourself, is this just poor impulse control or a literal addiction?